Welcome back to Roots Music History. On this podcast, we talk about the stories behind songs and legends, as well as new up-and-coming artists in a playlist called Roots History in the Making. On today's episode, we are finally going to be talking about Randy Rhodes. You might not recognize Randy's name right away. Randy was the lead guitarist for Ozzy Osbourne back in the day, but he was also just a really great guitarist and has been the influence for many guitarists for generations and generations following his tragic death. I really wanted to do a Roots documentary on Randy because he's had a really hard time getting a full documentary out there. There were a couple documentaries done in the past, but none of them ever really got traction or got licensing rights, and none of them told his whole story. So I was really excited to be able to put this together and have the freedom that YouTube gives me to put out his entire story in chronological order and also to talk specifically about his career and his death. So like I said, Randy is most well known for his work with Ozzy Osbourne in the early 80s and the two studio albums that he released with Ozzy, Blizzard of Oz and Diary of a Madman. But more so than just his studio work, he was considered one of the greatest guitarists of all time and was recently inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame back in 2021. While Randy's guitar style has lived on for generations and generations, there haven't been that many documentaries made about him. In 2022, there was a full-blown documentary called Randy Rhodes, Reflections of a Guitar Icon. But the producer had a really hard time putting that together and getting it to the finish line. And this is why I love YouTube and I love the freedom that it gives me because I am able to talk about these topics in a very free, non-licensed way. There was another documentary back in 2012 that was called Randy Rhodes Quiet Riot Years, but that one never got a formal release. In the 2022 documentary, not only did the producer not really go into his career and his death, but he also used interviews from the family that were for a completely different project. It wasn't for that specific documentary. So the documentary itself has really good content, but it kind of skips around. It's not very cohesive and it's definitely not in chronological order. So whether you are a fan of Randy already, or if this is your first time hearing his name, this is an incredible story about a young boy who rose to fame and became one of the world's greatest guitarists, only to be part of an extremely tragic accident that ended his career way too soon. Randy was born in Santa Monica, California on December 6th, 1956 to Dolores Violet and William Rhodes. Now, Dolores and William were both very musical themselves. Dolores and William were both studying music at the San Bernardino Community College when they met and a love affair began. Now, Dolores, who went by D, was only at the community college for a couple of years, and then she went on to UCLA, where she ended up getting her bachelor's degree in music. She and William were married in 1944, and in 1948, they bought a piece of land and hired an architect because the two of them wanted to build a music school. When the building was done, they named it Musonia School of Music, and this was in North Hollywood, California. Both Dolores and William taught at this school, and during these years, Dolores gave birth to two of Randy's older siblings, a brother and a sister. And then in 1956, Randy was born. But before Randy even turned two years old, Dee and William got a divorce. William left the family, and Dee was left to raise the children on her own. Randy absolutely adored his mother, by the way, and I'll skip ahead really quickly just to tell you. In the Blizzard of Oz album, there is a 50-second interlude where it's simply Randy playing the electric guitar in a song he called D, and this song was actually named after his mom. Also, right before his death, I'll kind of skip ahead a little bit, but his mother plays another really special and emotional role in his death, but we'll get to that later. So for the next several years, Dolores taught at the Musonia School of Music and raised her three kids. She was obviously a single mom, so money was really tight. They didn't have a radio, for example, and she wasn't going to live above her means to buy one either. So instead of playing the radio, the three kids learned how to play instruments and would play music on their own to entertain themselves. Dolores was six years old when she learned how to play. She started off on the piano. So when Randy turned six years old, Dolores thought it was time to get him his very first guitar. It was just a very simple acoustic guitar. And by the time he was in the first grade, his mother was consistently giving him music lessons at the Musonia School of Music. His brother also took up the drums and decided he wanted to be a drummer. 
As Randy started progressing through his school years, he also started becoming better and better at guitar. By the time Randy was 12 years old, he was playing a Spanish guitar and kind of jokes that he didn't know what he was playing. He was just playing the notes that his mother gave him. And it wasn't until he started to become a preteen, he started listening to the radio and deciding he wanted to sound like those tracks. That's when he started realizing he could learn how to play the songs on the radio and put these notes into a melody that he could memorize rather than just kind of aimlessly playing. He did that for a while and then he started expanding his musical collection and started being exposed to songs that had the electric guitar. Obviously, Randy fell in love with the sound of the electric guitar. So when he was in junior high, he went to his mom and said he wanted to switch from acoustic to electric. His mom was on board with it, so she actually had another teacher named Scott begin giving Randy lessons on the electric guitar. After just nine months of Scott teaching Randy the electric guitar, Scott went to his mother and said, ma'am, I can no longer teach your son. She was concerned at first. She thought maybe Randy did something wrong. She said, why? Why would that be? And he said, honestly, for the last few months, Randy has been teaching me and I can no longer keep up with him and there's nothing left for me to teach him. While Randy was in his junior high years, he formed a band with his schoolmate and best friend, Kelly Garney. Kelly and Randy would have a really great relationship for years to come. And it all started from this little duo that they put together where Randy was playing the electric guitar and he taught Kelly how to play the bass. So Kelly was the bass player. After a few weeks of just kind of rehearsing with each other, they decided to give themselves a band name, even though it was just the two of them. They called themselves the, I don't know if I can say that on YouTube. <laughs> it rhymes with bore. Now at this time, it really was just Randy playing the electric guitar, maybe humming some tunes, and Kelly playing the bass in the background. The two of them would jam pretty much on a weekly basis, and eventually they realized that if they started playing cover songs, they might actually be able to get some gigs. At that point, they decided to start marketing themselves to the families around town to play at their backyard parties. They knew they had to rebrand themselves, though, because the boar was a, a vulgar name. So they rebranded themselves and named their new band duo Violet Fox as a tribute to Randy's mother, whose middle name was Violet. As Violet Fox, they would go around to family to family in the area and play at their Christmas parties, birthday parties, or other types of backyard parties, really just cover songs. They did this all the way up through the beginning of their high school years. When Randy was a freshman in high school, his brother Kel, not to be confused with Kelly, the bass player, but his brother Kel came to him and said, hey, there's a really great concert in town. I really wanna take you and Kelly to see it. Randy said, who is it? And his brother said, it's Alice Cooper. And Randy said, I don't wanna go see her. And Kel said, trust me, once you see this, you'll understand why I brought you. So Kel took little Randy and little Kelly to this concert and said that Randy was mesmerized looking at the stage. He was practically hypnotized. And Randy's life forever changed because of this Alice Cooper concert. He decided in that moment, he didn't want to be just a cover song playing guitarist. He didn't want to do Spanish guitar at all. He wanted that type of edge that Alice Cooper had. He wanted that cool factor. I also just have to quickly interject. I was at an Alice Cooper concert last week in Nashville, Tennessee, and I was hypnotized looking at the stage too. I don't know if anyone here has. If you have, please comment your Alice Cooper experience down below, but it was insane. Like one of the best, I think it was actually the best show I've ever seen, but Tommy Henriksen is another amazing guitarist. It was funny because I really wanted to go up and talk to Tommy. It wasn't happening. The cookie wasn't crumbling in a way that I could go talk to Tommy. So I was pretty disappointed and I ended up saying to somebody else, how I really wanted to see Tommy. They, I guess, told Tommy that I really wanted to see him. And Tommy literally reached out to me and was the nicest person in the entire world. He said, I can't believe I didn't get to talk to you. You know, I'm so sorry, this and that. And just, he's so genuine. Then I started following his Instagram and looking at what he posts and how he interacts with people. And he had this live video that he did on Facebook. Or it might've just been Instagram, not Facebook. But he just genuinely connects with his fans. You don't get that with a lot of artists. So I just, I had to make that short interjection because I am talking about Alice Cooper right now. The history behind Alice Cooper is so, so cool. And I don't know if Alice Cooper, I'm sure he knows, I'm sure he knows that he changed the course of musical history by putting on this show in front of Randy Rhodes back in 1971. If it wasn't for the Alice Cooper show and for Randy Rhodes going to that show, we would never have had a Randy Rhodes. We would never have had a Randy Rhodes style if it weren't for Alice Cooper and for the 
higher power, and this is what we talk about on Roots Music, the higher power that interjects into music history to make music history what it is and what we experience. Also, if you haven't followed Tommy Henriksen on Instagram, I will link his Instagram and his YouTube and any other thing I can find about Tommy and Nita Strauss in the description down below. Those are two guitarists that are current history in the making, right? Um, that you can follow now. So, but continuing on with Randy's story. So he was at this Alice Cooper concert and it was absolutely life-changing. He says to his brother after that concert, I can do that. I can be that person and I want to be. So immediately after seeing the Alice Cooper concert, he and Kel and Kelly come back to their house and they're just kind of on this high from Alice. And Randy says, you know, guys, we should rebrand ourselves. And then they thought, you know, to really kick it up a notch, why don't we have Kel play the drums? Kel was like, sure, I'll play drums with you guys. So together they named themselves Little Women. Now, like I said, Randy was in high school at this time and Randy was extremely smart. He was not dumb. It kind of reminds me of the Don McLean story, the man who wrote the song American Pie, you know, bye bye Miss American Pie. Don actually felt the same way about school. He felt like it was a waste of time. Don was also very smart. His father really wanted him to get an education, which is why he ultimately did. But the way he did that was by playing music during the day and then taking night classes to finish his degree. It's that same kind of hustle vibe that you get from Randy Rhodes because Randy also felt that way. He knew that this music had potential. He wanted to put his energy into the music, but he also was smart and wanted an education and he wanted to finish school. What Randy did was he put himself into an accelerated program. It was a special program that the school offered, and he was able to graduate high school an entire year earlier than his peers. Because of this, Randy graduated around 16 or 17 years old instead of 18 and was able to devote all of his time to little women and to teaching at the music shop that his mom ran in his free time. Not having high school on his plate, Randy had a lot more time to devote to the operations of little women as well as to playing. And because of that, he was able to get him, Kelly and Kel a lot more gigs. After about two or three years playing with little women, though, Randy's older brother, Kel, wanted to move on with his life. So he told Kelly and Randy that he was no longer going to play the drums for them. Randy and Kelly were kind of disappointed, but they completely understood and they wanted Kel to have his own life and to pursue his own dreams. So in 1975, Randy and Kelly were in need of a new drummer. Now, Randy and Kelly are talking to each other and thinking, if we're going to get a new drummer at this stage in our lives, you know, now we're about 18 years old, we're kind of entering that next phase of life, we should kick the band up another notch and we should get a lead singer as well. So it was 1975 when Randy was 19 years old, he started making a few phone calls to see who would be available to be the lead singer of Little Women. He ended up calling a guy named Kevin who immediately agreed. Kevin loved Randy. He was in awe of Randy. In those early years, Kevin would go around to people and say, I'm playing with the greatest guitarist of all time. And he would say to his mom and to his family, you know, I don't care if nobody else thinks that. I think that. I see that. I know that. He is the greatest guitarist of all time. As far as Kevin was concerned, the sun rose and set on Randy. He absolutely adored Randy as a person and as a musician. Kevin was immediately in. In that same year, in those same few months, Randy and Kelly are also looking for a new drummer. When a guy named Drew, who had crossed paths with Randy and Kelly in their earlier years, is looking for an opportunity and thinks, huh, I wonder what Randy's up to. So just out of dumb luck, he says, as or as we say on Roots Music, divine music intervention, Drew ends up calling Randy and saying, hey, Randy, what's up? What are you up to? I'm a drummer. I'm looking for something to do. I was just thought I'd see if you th knew of any opportunities or were looking for anybody. And Randy was like, I can't believe you're calling me right now. I literally just got Kevin to be the singer of Little Women. And my brother, Kel, is leaving the band and we're looking for a drummer. Immediately, Drew is on board. So by mid-1975, they had a full-blown band. They decided to rename themselves from Little Women to Quiet Riot. Someone from the band, and I'm not sure who it was, but they had come back and said, what about the name Quiet Riot? quite right, because I guess he heard some British guy say quite right and thought it was funny. So he came in and said quite right. And then somebody else said, well, that's funny, but like quiet riot. And then they thought, huh, that's funny. We should call ourselves quiet riot. So that's how quiet riot got its name. And by the end of 1975, they were playing gigs everywhere in the LA scene at bars and clubs. And they were becoming really well known just simply by playing out at bars and clubs. Randy would always wear polka dots at the shows and eventually fans started showing up to shows in polka dots. I would say that the quiet riot fan base was extremely 
loyal. And this is the thing about Randy Rhodes that I will take you to the parking lot on because we're going to get to Van Halen in a second. Everybody kind of compares Randy and Van Halen. But the thing about Randy and Quiet Riot is their fan base loved them. Anyone who saw them live came away from that show as a different person. And that's the point I really want to drive home in this documentary. People were blown away seeing Randy Rhodes live. It was like it was like seeing the second coming of Christ. And no one was the same. And that's why their fans were so loyal. And that's why, you know, even Drew, the drummer, said it could be a random Friday and Quiet Riot would show up at a bar and hundreds of people would show up. And that never happened. You know, this is before Instagram, before Facebook, before you can mass alert people that someone's going to be somewhere. People would just show up because they heard about the guitarist in Quiet Riot. Everyone also says Randy just had this aura about him. And it could be when he's playing that you felt it, but it could also be if he was just walking in the room, he would just walk in and heads would turn. He just gave off this incredible energy that people were drawn to, like a moth to a light. And on top of that too, Randy was just a really good kid. He never got into a lot of trouble. He was a religious child. He believed in God. He believed in divine intervention. He believed in all of that. And he was pretty straight as an arrow. You know, he wasn't perfect. He had his partying moments, but he was by no means aimless in life. He was by no means misdirected. He was a very serious musician with goals and clear ways to get to those goals. And he did not let partying or girls or drugs or anything like that into his life in a way that would have distracted him from those goals or from just being a good person. So for a few years, from 1975 through about 1977, Quiet Riot is doing really well for themselves and they're becoming really well known. They even hired a president of their fan club who would print out merchandise and respond to fans and make sure that people knew where he was going to be and when. And people were walking around in polka dots because of Randy. So this was a great two years for Quiet Riot. Like I said, a lot of people were comparing Randy and Van Halen as one of the same in this time frame. Both Van Halen and Randy were playing at the same LA clubs and bars. So conversations were kind of like, hey, there's this really great guitarist in Quiet Riot named Randy Rose. And then the other guy would say, oh yeah? Well, have you seen Eddie Van Halen? Or someone would say, hey, I just saw Eddie Van Halen playing you know, at the Troubadour, wherever it might be. I don't know that they ever played at the Troubadour, just an example. And then someone else would say, oh yeah, well, but have you seen Randy Rhodes in Quiet Riot? And they were similar in age as well. Now, I don't know if this is true or not, but it is said that Van Halen would go see Randy and Quiet Riot play, but Randy and Quiet Riot never went to see Van Halen play. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's just what is said. Van Halen also made a comment. I know most of you are thinking it right now. Van Halen made a comment in an interview once where he said Randy Rhodes learned everything from him. I'm not saying that it's not true, but I think that with Van Halen, well, I don't want to jump ahead. Let's finish in chronological order, and then we'll get back to uh, my opinions about Van Halen and Randy. At one point, Randy's guitar tech actually took a sticker of Van Halen's face and put it on Randy's guitar pedal so that every time Randy stomped, he was like stomping on Van Halen's face. I just want to stress this for a second. This was like a friendly rivalry, but at the same time, Randy really wanted to prove himself as a guitarist. Sure, you know, maybe Randy did take some techniques of Van Halen for sure, because as a guitarist, you're constantly looking at other guitarists and taking techniques that you like and that you want to incorporate in your music. Randy had a bunch of really unique techniques that he would do. One thing that he did, he'd take the neck as he was playing and kind of like bend the neck almost, which gave the guitar this entirely different sound. He really went outside the lines in his playing. He would also use his palm to like mute the knobs of his guitar. People, when they went to see Randy, they were not just seeing someone playing the guitar. They were seeing someone absolutely owning the guitar and taking the guitar to places they had never seen before. Unless maybe Van Halen did it and they saw Van Halen do it. (laughs) But Randy really was serious and he wanted to be seen as Van Halen's equal. He wanted to be the greatest guitarist of all time, not from a place of ego and not from a place of fame, but just because he wanted to be the best guitarist, period, paragraph. I think that's where this whole kind of, quote, rivalry with Van Halen comes into play. You know, they didn't not like each other. And the guitar tech actually said that he did it to, quote, piss off Randy. I don't know. I think it was just funny. And Randy was kind of like, what the heck, dude? But then he was like, all right. And he did it anyway. In these years as well, Randy and Quiet Riot ended up hiring a manager named Dennis. 
They also took a garage and converted the garage into a full-blown rehearsal space because they really wanted to take this band seriously and they wanted to get signed with a label. That was the ultimate goal. Dennis was a really great guy. Dennis actually got Randy his very first Les Paul and saw the potential in Randy to go really far. He believed in Randy and he believed in Quiet Riot. As a manager, was he the best manager that they could have possibly had? I can't answer that question. Dennis might have been doing the best that he could with what he had, but Quiet Riot was becoming frustrated because they were not getting signed with anyone under Dennis. They ended up pivoting away from Dennis to another manager right around 1976. In April of 1977, Randy Rhodes and Van Halen actually played together. A lot of people might not know this. This was their only show that they ever did together. When they found out that the two of them were gonna be playing together, Van Halen and Randy and the venue genuinely could not decide who should be the headlining act and who should be the opener. It really was a situation where both Van Halen and Quiet Riot and Randy Rhodes were equals. In fact, on the flyer for the show, they ended up putting Van Halen and Quiet Riot in equal font. It wasn't until literally right before the show, Van Halen signed a record deal. This was actually really hard for Randy Rhodes and for Quiet Riot. They had been working so hard to get a deal and they were not getting a deal. And then right before this show, where both of them are set to play, Van Halen signs. So in that moment, Randy Rhodes and Quiet Riot were basically throwing up their hands and saying, look, this is obvious. You should be the opening act because you you now have a record deal. And even though Van Halen was set to be the headliner at this show, Randy really wanted to pull out his very best guitar skills to show the crowd that he deserved to be signed to. He rehearsed so hard for this show. There were a thousand people who were set to be there, which was one of the biggest shows or one of the bigger shows that Randy and Quiet Riot had played. And on the day of the show, Randy woke up with a 101 degree fever and he was extremely sick with the flu. He had muscle aches. He was throwing up. He was sweating. He was very adamant that they were not going to cancel the show because he was sick. He went up on stage and played his heart out. He played the hardest he's ever played because he really, like I said, wanted people to see him as Van Halen's equal. In fact, he played so hard and was so sick that after that show, Randy came off stage and absolutely collapsed and hit his head because he was so worn out. After that show ended, Quiet Riot was desperate for a record deal. They, this is all they wanted. They actually had their fan club president start printing out shirts and arranging a protest to go to the record labels and protest not having a deal. While the fan club president is putting together and organizing all of these protests, Quiet Riot, through a very small studio, released their own album, self-released, but it was only released in Japan, <laughs> which, you know, it is what it is, but at least they got something out there. While their music is circulating through Japan, their fan club president is going to all of the Quiet Riot fans and organizing protests in front of these recording studios saying like, sign Quiet Riot, sign Quiet Riot. <laughs> And just remember, this is before Instagram, before social media. So the way that this was orchestrated and actually came together is incredible. And it really speaks to the loyalty of the Quiet Riot fans and how incredible Randy Rhodes was live because nobody was listening to Randy Rhodes on the radio. Nobody was listening to his music anywhere other than in person. And in person, it was rocking their world. So these people showed up to these protests. They were actually massive. It wasn't until the third recording studio, though, where they actually got on the news and it was kind of a very brief news story, <laughs> which is unfortunate. I think they were expecting much more press from this. Now, during this 1977-1978 time frame, they are having conversations with certain labels, but the labels were saying to them, you know, try to sound like this, try to sound like that, try to come up with this and then come back to us with that. Quiet Riot was taking the direction from the labels, going back to their rehearsal studio and recording what they thought the label wanted to hear to the point where they even recorded a disco song because a label told them disco is popular right now. Go back, give us a disco song. But by the time they would go write a disco song and then come back to the label with the disco song, disco was out and now somebody else was popular and now they needed to sound like them. They were really chasing their tail, trying to come up with anything that the record label would take. And in that, they kind of lost themselves. But at the same time, Quiet Riot is really struggling with these record labels and getting their foot in the door. Van Halen is 
is signed and he's releasing music. And not only is he releasing music, he's releasing really good music. It was just such a blow to Randy and to Quiet Riot, who had the same talent, arguably. If you want to argue about it, I'll take you to the parking lot. It was hard. It was really hard for Quiet Riot to see this happening. And in a lot of ways, they started to feel like failures. And of course, people deal with frustration and with these feelings of failure in different ways. Kelly Garney, who was playing bass for Quiet Riot, who was Randy's childhood friend, he turned to alcohol and to partying as a way to cope with this feeling and this frustration. Things started to get really hard for Quiet Riot when Kelly started going down this road. Obviously, he was becoming more emotional. He was becoming hot-headed. You know, anytime someone gets caught up in that kind of a lifestyle, their biology literally changes. His energy was terrible. He was fighting with everyone. The drummer said that he had frustrations with Kelly, which not even related to his personality, but just in general, Kelly would just play. You know, the drummer is supposed to keep time. The rest of the band is supposed to play to the beat of the drummer, but Kelly wouldn't do that. He would just kind of go off the rails and go off of time. And then Randy would be trying to keep up with Kelly. It was really throwing off the vibe of the band, you know, their energy and their actual playing. What was even worse is Kelly and the lead singer, Kevin, never got along in the first place. So when Kelly started going down this road and frustrations started taking over and Kevin was frustrated too, they all wanted success. It really just kind of fueled the fire between Kelly and Kevin. They couldn't hold in any longer how much they hated each other. (laughs) There was one incident Specifically, that was very pivotal to the band falling apart where Kelly took a handgun and fired it at the ceiling. And then Randy jumped in to stop Kelly. Kelly started fist fighting Randy. Kevin is screaming in the background, F you Kelly, this and that. It was really bad. I mean, it wasn't just that they were fighting. Things were getting physical and threatening and quite serious. So Kelly ends up leaving Quiet Riot, not so quietly in a riot. They ended up replacing Kelly with a guy named Rudy Sarzo. Rudy was great. By the way, Rudy was extremely professional. He got along with Kevin and with Randy and with the drummer. Why did I forget the drummer's name? I just blanked on the drummer's name. Drew. Drew. (laughs) The drummers, they just, you know, randomly combust sometimes. And, you know, I don't know where they, I don't know where they go. Um, But he got along with everyone. He also played on time. He would listen to the drums. He would listen to the beat. He was very professional. He was also very goal oriented, which was really important for Randy because like I said, Randy was a serious musician with serious goals. He didn't let drugs or partying or all of this get in the way of his guitar playing. And Rudy felt the same way. So for the next year, year and a half, They're still trying to get signed. It's still not working, but they really had a better synergy having Rudy on board. But Randy was starting to feel like Quiet Riot wasn't going to go anywhere. You know, even with Rudy, they still were not getting signed. They had changed managers a couple times and it just wasn't happening for them. It was either late 1978 or early 1979 when Randy was told about Ozzy Osbourne having an audition for a guitarist. Now, Ozzy Osbourne had just been booted from Black Sabbath. They kicked him out because his alcohol and his drug use was just way too much to deal with and very unprofessional. So they ended up getting rid of Ozzy. Ozzy's on his own. He's staying in a hotel somewhere, uh, doesn't really know what he's going to do with his career or his life. So he decides he's just going to start his own his own band, and he needs a lead guitarist. So he says to this guy, I need a lead guitarist. Can you find me one? And the guy's like, okay. And Ozzy had a list of guitarists that he wanted to interview or that he wanted to audition. And his assistant, I'm not sure who the who it was at the moment. I, I know it in my soul, but I can't remember his name. But he says to his assistant, these are the guys that I want to interview. And the assistant looks at the list and is like, uh, okay, we will, but I know a guy. I know a guy. And he was thinking of Randy Rhodes. He contacts Randy Rhodes and says, why don't you come out here and do this audition for Ozzy? Randy's like, oh, I don't know. You know, I teach at the school until 10 p.m. I'm tired after teaching. I don't know. It was like very out of the box for Randy to even think about doing this. He really encouraged him to go. Randy asked Rudy Sarzo, you know, what do you think? Rudy was like, absolutely, you have to do it. Randy ended up going to the audition. He's funny. He starts tuning up his guitar. He starts playing a couple of riffs, just kind of warming up when they all looked at him and said, you've got it. And Randy was like, what? You didn't even hear me play yet. (laughs) They're like, well, that's it. You've got the look. You've got the talent. We can tell. 
We want you. Rudy Sarzo actually put in a really good word for Randy to Ozzy and Sharon. Rudy said to Ozzy and Sharon, look, Randy's perfect. He's going to be great for you. He's a good influence. He's not going to be a bad influence on Ozzy. He's going to be a good one. He's a good kid. He's got a lot of direction. He's a serious musician. Who knows how much weight that good word held. Ozzy and the band and Sharon, who was their manager at the time, said, yes, we want Randy. So Randy joins Ozzy. He actually went over to London for a while and was living with them in London, I think for a year or something like that, before they came back to America and really started laying down some tracks. It's funny because Randy was such a good kid. He actually did not really like Black Sabbath. He said to his brother, don't tell Ozzy I'm saying this, but I didn't even like Black Sabbath. He didn't like Ozzy. He thought it was silly that Ozzy had his name tattooed on his hand. He's like, who tattoos his name on his knuckles, you know? And Ozzy was clearly on a different vibration from Randy. But at the same time, Randy really respected his experience in the music industry. And he really wanted to learn from Ozzy. Even though he thought certain things were weird, he wanted to learn from him. And that really speaks to the humility of Randy Rhodes. He was such a humble person, always willing to learn through wanting to be the best. He had this consistent humility. And with Ozzy, he knew he could learn a lot from Ozzy. So he really saw Ozzy as a mentor, like a weird mentor, but a mentor nonetheless. (laughs) But Randy actually hated arrogance in the music industry. And when he would come across people who were arrogant, you know, who wouldn't take a picture with someone who wouldn't sign a thing, who walked around with this holier than thou attitude, he really hated it. Once Randy and Ozzy were back in America laying down some tracks, Randy one day is just playing and he comes up with the riff for Crazy Train. Crazy Train would absolutely turn around Ozzy's career and catapult Randy's. Truly, if it wasn't for Randy Rhodes and that riff for Crazy Train and just his overall aura and guitar playing, Ozzy's career would have been over. And Ozzy knows that. And Randy's career never would have taken off if he hadn't made this connection with Ozzy. And Randy knew that too. So despite their differences and their different personalities and different approaches towards life, the two of them were a really great yin and yang for each other. And Crazy Train brought it all together. Crazy Train ended up being the very first song on their album, Blizzard of Oz, which ended up being released in 1980. This album would go platinum not once, not twice, not even three times, but four times in the US alone. And it sold, I believe, over 7 million copies worldwide. Just crazy, crazy train. Blizzard of Oz was so incredibly popular. After releasing Blizzard of Oz, Ozzy and Randy rushed back to the studio and Ozzy and his team wanted to put together a second album as quickly as possible. They wanted to shoot while the ducks were in the air. In a matter of like two months, a second album was recorded and released. Randy says that the second album was a little bit rushed. It was a little stressful. He says he couldn't really do everything he wanted to do in the second album because of the time limit. But he says he was overall pretty happy with what he did given the amount of time that he had. The way he feels about the second album is the way we now feel about his life. We feel like his life was rushed. We could have had so much more from Randy and he could have taken us to places he never was able to take us. The first album with Ozzy is probably the best insight we have into where we could have gone with him. But the second album too, I mean, it's it's a great second album. But you think about everything that he could have done had his life not been cut short. And it just rips you like a dagger, you know, to think about what we never got. But he says, yeah, he says he was happy with the second album. Now also with this newfound success, Ozzy started getting a little loose. He started getting a little comfortable in this success and his freak flag started to uh, wave a little bit. So, you know, there was some managing that needed to be done of Ozzy, but they were really able to kind of rise above that and continue the band operations in a fairly good way. Because despite Ozzy's behavior and the reoccurrence of his addictions, the band was doing remarkably well. In 1982, after the second album was released, the band started going on tour and playing shows all around the country. This time, the tour group consisted of Rudy Sarzo on bass, Don Airy played keyboards, Ozzy, of course, was the singer, Randy, of course, the guitarist. The drummer was a guy named Tommy Aldridge. 
Their band manager was Sharon Arden, who would obviously become Sharon Osborne. Rachel Youngblood was also part of their tour entourage. She was the hairdresser and costume designer. She basically did anything relating to their look, their makeup, that sort of a thing. She was the oldest, I think, at 58 years old. Jake Duncan was the tour manager. Andy Acock was their tour bus driver. And Wanda Acock would sometimes be on the bus, sometimes not, sometimes at a show, sometimes no. Wanda and Andy were married but they were separated. It's weird because she's referred to as his ex-wife, but I think they were legally married and they were just separated, but sometimes together. Not totally sure. It seems very toxic. So they continued to play and go on tour all the way up until March of 1982. The band had two shows the weekend of March 19th. Their first show was Thursday night in Knoxville, Tennessee. And their second show that weekend was set to be in Orlando, Florida for the Tangerine Bowl. After the Knoxville gig, their bus driver, Andy, was going to drive them from Knoxville, Tennessee to Orlando, Florida. Now, obviously, that's way too far to drive in one day. So he decided to stop in Leesburg, Florida, where he had a house on an estate with the Calhoun Tour Bus Company. It was a huge estate with three different houses and an airplane hangar that all kind of surrounded this runway. And there were maybe four or five really small aircrafts that were held in the hangar at a given time. All of those aircrafts were owned by the folks who owned the mansions on the estates. So for Andy, this was the perfect place to stop and to park the bus for a while before continuing on to Orlando, Florida, which was only about 40 miles away from Leesburg, but still far enough that he wanted to stop in Leesburg and kind of take a breath. The Knoxville gig ended around 10.30 p.m. Sharon went to bed around 11.30 p.m., but Ozzy and the band members were up pretty late, maybe 3, 4 a.m., before they decided to take a nap and go to bed. Andy, of course, didn't sleep. He was driving the bus. It's roughly a nine-hour drive from Knoxville, Tennessee to Leesburg, Florida, and Andy pretty much drove the whole thing without any breaks. They arrived in Leesburg, Florida around 8.30 a.m., Andy, of course, hadn't slept all night, and the rest of the band had just recently fallen asleep and were fast asleep on the tour bus. Now, a few of them had gone to bed around the same time that Sharon did. I believe it was Don, Randy, Rachel Youngblood, and I think one or two other people had gone to bed around 1130 or midnight. The estate that they stopped at was called Flying Baron Ranch, and it was right off Road 44 in Leesburg. Andy Acock and Wanda's house was there, and the people who owned, like I said, the Calhoun tour bus company owned the other houses. According to the deputy who reported on scene after the tragic accident, Andy had parked the tour bus about 90 yards from the landing strip that was in the center of the estate and about 15 yards from the front door of his house. Andy pulls up, parks the bus, and he's still awake. At this time, Randy is waking up. So is Don Airy, who played the keyboards. Jake Duncan, the road manager, was also waking up. But Wanda, Rachel Youngblood, Sharon, Ozzy, and the drummer, Tommy Aldridge, they were all still sleeping on the bus. And Rudy, Rudy was still asleep on the bus too. Andy opens the door to the tour bus, shuts it, goes into the house and starts making some coffee. Randy and Rachel and Don and Jake, they come out of the bus and go into the house with Andy. They were sitting there as the coffee brewed, thinking about what they were going to do that day. They had the whole day to do whatever they wanted. It wasn't until that night they were going to drive just 40 miles out to Orlando, Florida, so that they would be there first thing in the morning for their sound checks. Now, because Randy and Don and Rachel and Jake had a full night's sleep, they had energy and they were excited to be at Andy's estate. They had never been there before. And obviously this is a beautiful property. So Andy kind of is walking them around and he shows them the airplane hangar. He says, why don't I take a few of you up for a joyride? Randy says no, and Rachel says no, that's all right, but Don and Jake said yes. Randy and Rachel stayed behind at the house while Don and Jake went up in the plane. They came out once the plane was airborne to see what they were doing, and Randy was taking some photos. But then Andy started doing some kind of scary and risky maneuvers. He was buzzing the bus several times with Don and Jake on board. Andy thought it was funny because he was trying to really scare the people who were sleeping on the tour bus. He thought, how hilarious would it be if you're just passed out on a bus and all of a sudden a plane just comes right, you know, over your head? How funny and hilarious. 
Um, well, Randy and Rachel are watching Andy buzzing the bus and it's making them very uncomfortable. You know, like I said, throughout this video, Randy was a good kid. He didn't partake in risky behaviors, whether those risky behaviors were drinking or partying or being with women he didn't know. He didn't, he wasn't a risky person. So he, I mean, he took risks for sure. And he wasn't an angel, but he wasn't like a crazy person. So this was making Randy pretty uncomfortable. You know, he's not a blue angel, but he's acting like he can do all these airplane tricks. So he comes down and Randy and Rachel are kind of like, that was crazy. He comes off the plane and so does Don and so does Jake. They were hyped up. They thought it was kind of cool. And they said, hey, you know, you should really go up there. It's really beautiful up there. Randy says, you know, I don't know. Like, I'm not really a fan of those airplane tricks. And Rachel says, absolutely not. I have a heart issue. You know, I can't be doing tricks like that with my heart. And Andy said, oh, don't worry about, okay, don't worry. I'll take you up. You can take some photos. I promise not to do any of the tricks or maneuvers that I did with Don and Jake. Rachel, I know you have a heart issue. It'll just be a very calm ride, but I'll just take you up so you can take some photos and then we'll come right back down. And Randy said, okay, he agreed to that. He thought it would be cool to quote, take some photos for his mom. So Randy goes into the tour bus and he gets another camera. He gives one of his cameras to Don Airy, who played the keyboards. And he asked Don if he would take photos of him going up in the plane to send to his mom. Don said yes, he took the camera. And the whole time Don was standing next to the tour bus, taking photos of the plane taking off and of Randy in the plane. Randy also took up with him a second camera because he wanted to take photos out the window to send to his mom. This was all for his mom. He wanted his mom to see every part of this plane ride. Rachel Youngblood was in the back seat of the plane. This plane, by the way, was a small 1955 Bonanza. Soon after, Andy takes off with Randy in the passenger seat and Rachel in the back, he starts doing the things he promised Randy and Rachel he wouldn't do. He started buzzing the bus again. He buzzed the bus once, then he buzzed it twice. The third time that Andy came around to buzz the bus, he was aiming extremely low, almost to the point where the nose of the plane would have directly hit the tour bus. Randy obviously saw this happening. Don could see Randy in the passenger seat of the cockpit fighting with Andy. Don believes that Randy was mad because Andy had promised he wouldn't do this with Randy and Rachel on board. Don believes that Randy was arguing with Andy, saying, stop, don't do this. The third time Andy came down to buzz the bus, the aircraft abruptly kind of churned and the wing of the aircraft hit the tour bus and then it cartwheeled over a tree into the house. Now, like I said, in that moment, the plane burst into flames and the entire part of the house that was hit by the plane erupted in flames and was completely burned. Don had been next to the bus taking pictures this entire time. He was able to run out of the way on the third time when he recognized the plane was much closer than it had been the previous two times. He was okay. So was the other person he was with who was also taking photos. But Randy and Rachel and Andy were killed upon impact. Randy was 25 years old and Rachel was 58. Andy Acock, the pilot, was 36. An autopsy of Andy's body showed traces of cocaine. An autopsy of Randy's body only showed that Randy had a little bit of nicotine in his system. Rachel did not have an autopsy because her family didn't want her to have one. Don is obviously a survivor, so was Jake, but Don had the camera and was actually watching the crash happen. He told authorities the plane at one point was perpendicular to the the runway. Those were the types of maneuvers Andy was doing with Randy and Rachel on board, in addition to buzzing the bus. There was a man inside the house at the time of the crash who was named Jesse Herndon. He was 70 years old and walked away uninjured. Ozzy and Sharon and Wanda and Rudy, everyone else who was on the tour bus, was uninjured. Ozzy says he just woke up. He thought the tour bus had crashed. He was so passed out. He didn't know what had happened. All he knew was he felt kind of a, a jolt and heard a crash. He thought they were in a road crash. Wanda said that she had woken up and was looking out the front of the bus and saw the plane coming towards the bus. She didn't see the actual crash, but she heard it. And she heard someone say, don't come out, don't come out. Possibly Don or Jake yelling to them inside of the tour bus, don't come out, don't look at this, it's really bad. But they did, and they saw what happened. 
Ozzy and Sharon also said once they got out of the tour bus, they were trying to find a phone and they had a really hard time finding a phone. They said they went to someone, maybe a neighbor or someone who was working in the hangar. I don't know, but they said they went to somebody and said, is there a phone? We need a phone. And they had a hard time getting a phone. Um, But what's weird is that as soon as they got the phone, the first person Sharon called was her dad. So I don't, I think they wanted a phone because they were just panicking and they just needed to phone someone. But the people there were more concerned with the emergency response that was taking place. And their first priority was getting emergency responders there. After Sharon called her dad and the emergency crews were there, Ozzy and Sharon and Wanda and Don and Jake, everybody went to the Hillco Inn in Leesburg immediately after the crash and after Sharon had called her father, after the emergency responders were there, after everything was kind of settled in what was happening in that moment, then Ozzy and Sharon and Jake and Don and Rudy all went to the Hillco Inn in Leesburg, Florida. They really just kind of went into isolation and secluded themselves. They weren't answering any press. They weren't answering any questions. They were in a really deep state of mourning. Obviously, they canceled their show for the next day. Dr. William Schutz was the Lake County examiner at that time. He was the one who was working on this case after the crash. He said that the bodies were unrecognizable. They had been burned so badly. He said the only way to identify Randy Rhodes was by his cross necklace that he wore around his neck. The only way they were able to identify Andy was by his dental charts. After Ozzy and the rest of the band went to the Hillco Inn, the authorities also seized the bus. They put it in a locked up garage so that the FAA could examine it later. Now, if you remember, I said Wanda had woken up and was looking out the front window of the bus as the plane was headed towards them. Rudy had been sleeping at the time, but after he heard this detail, he strongly believed Andy was mad at Wanda and was aiming to hit the bus. Is it possible that Wanda got up and looked outside the window of the tour bus and Andy in that moment was having a fight with her and was mad at her and wanted to aim right at her, thinking in his cocaine, you know, ridden mind that he could just clip the front of the bus and everything would be fine. He'd just get her and boy, would he boy, would he get her? Uh, I don't know. Um, Rudy in his interviews, he's convinced this was a murder suicide by Andy. Now, Rudy spent the most time with Andy and Wanda. Uh, So did Don. So did everyone else. So I will say that Rudy probably knows the dynamic that was taking place and the personalities. And it's not, to me, it's not out of the question. Andy had supposedly been bragging the entire time, starting from their show in Knoxville, Tennessee, when he knew they were going to be stopping in Leesburg. He had been bragging that he was a pilot. He had planes. He knew how to fly. And he was saying for you know at least two days prior to this accident, I'm going to take you guys up in the plane. I'm going to take you up. I'll show you. I'll take you up in the plane. Did Andy strategically stop at this location and park the bus 15 yards from the house, 90 yards from the runway? And did he orchestrate in his mind that he was going to do this, knowing that Wanda was on board? Rudy says yes. Don says he saw fighting going on in the cockpit. He believes that Randy was trying to stop Andy from doing these maneuvers. Did Randy see Andy aiming for the tour bus and save everyone's life on that tour bus? Rudy says yes. Rudy believes that From Don's account of the fighting going on in the cockpit, Randy had actually turned the aircraft at the last second. Because if you remember, the aircraft was just buzzing the tour bus, buzzing the top of the bus. But on the third time, it turned. And it turned so abruptly that the wing clipped it instead of the base of the plane. It was just the wing. Then the plane hit the tree and cartwheeled. Was Randy on board that plane and realized that Andy was headed straight towards the center of the bus? Did Randy grab the controls and abruptly turn the plane himself? Rudy truly believes the only reason he, Sharon, Ozzy, and Wanda, and Tommy are alive today is because of Randy's quick thinking and quick action. The details become even more disturbing when we start looking into Andy Acock's history. Now, even though Andy had been bragging to the band that he was a licensed pilot for days, and he had been a licensed pilot and he had over 1,500 hours of flight time, but his pilot's medical certificate had expired in 1979. So he was legally not allowed to be up in the air 
that day at all. The plane he decided to take up, that 1955 Bonanza, hadn't been flown in over a year. Therefore, that plane also did not have its annual safety certificate. What's worse is six years prior, Andy had killed someone else in a helicopter crash, a crash he walked away from unscathed. The owner of the aircraft also said that he did not give Andy permission to take that plane up in the air. The words he used with the FAA were stolen. He said Andy stole the plane. He had no permission to take it. He said he wasn't even flying the plane. It was an obsolete plane just kind of sitting there, like I said, hadn't been flown in a year. And extremely inappropriate that Andy would just walk into the hangar, take the keys off of the hook, and take it up into the air without consulting anyone or getting permission or anything. I personally think if Andy was on a suicide murder mission, I think he would have done it the first time. I think he would have just taken up the plane without anyone else in it, hit the tour bus, and been more intentional about it. In my personal opinion, and from what I've read, and from what I've heard, and just my personal gut feeling, I think, is that Andy was just a troubled guy. He was careless. He was reckless. He was engaging in risky behaviors his whole life, which resulted in the helicopter crash, which resulted in a cocaine habit, which resulted in this toxic relationship with this woman, Wanda, who was or was not his wife. You have to be very careful of someone who exhibits any type of risky behavior, whether it's even just going out and getting wasted on a Saturday night and coming back and, you know, just Risky behaviors are, are risky, right? There's no better way to put it. And it sounds like he had a history of risky behavior. And again, it sounds like he was just the opposite type of personality from Randy. Randy was a good kid. You know, he, I believe, did churn the plane. And I believe he was fighting with Andy. And it really is unfortunate and really, really sad that you have someone like Randy Rhodes with this incredible talent, with the, these incredible morals. He was a very moral person and very disciplined and well-directed and smart. And you take someone like him and you put him in the presence of someone like Andy Acock. And it's a very important lesson in life to be very careful of your company. Now, I'm not saying that Randy made the wrong decision by joining the Ozzy Osbourne band. I'm def definitely not saying that at all because you can also be in someone's company and be okay and still have this kind of wall around you where you don't let them in, but it's difficult, but it can happen. Um, in this case, you know, it's just sad. It's just sad because it's not, Randy did nothing wrong and it's not a bad thing that he joined the band, but it, it's part of a larger lesson that you do need to be careful about who you spend your time with, who is in your life, who you even get into a car with, nonetheless an airplane. Um, but at the same time, you know, <laughs> Andy was his tour bus driver and he had just, he had been driving them safely from point A to point B this entire time. So it's just sad, but I do want to highlight just that kind of life lesson. There are several affidavits that were given to the police right after the crash. Ozzy Osbourne gave an affidavit uh, sworn to on the 20th day of March, 1982. Rudy Sarzo also gave a full affidavit. Wanda Acock and Sharon Arden all have their full affidavits. If you are a Roots Music History member, for the third level members, I post special members only videos where we go through all of the newspaper articles. I post the full interviews. So if I have a Roots documentary that I have interviewed someone and put a snippet of that interview into the video, I have the full uncut interviews for members only on that platform. I also, in this case, uh, read through each affidavit word for word in that members only video. I think it's only like 20 minutes long. I will put a link in the description below that shows you how you can join the different membership levels. There's a level one, a level two, and a level three. And it's the level three that gives you access to all of these members only videos. Um, but I, I did summarize them in this. So it's not like you're not getting the full story just by listening to this. And obviously a free way to support the channel is to just subscribe and give it a like and give it a positive comment. That means more to me than you will ever know. This is just such an incredibly sad story. And it's also, I think, very uplifting though, because it shows that there are really good 
people in the music industry like Randy Rhodes, someone who had humility, someone who wanted to be the best, but in a very non-egotistical way, someone who was extremely talented and disciplined and always had a cross around his neck. He was extremely faithful and a good person to everyone who came into contact with him. I think an even greater testament, not just to Randy, is also owed to his mother. His mother was a single mom and she raised three incredible kids and Randy was one of them. Dee actually lived to be 95 years old. So it was an incredible life for Dolores Rhodes being Randy Rhodes' mother and his legacy lived on for years and years and years and years <laughs> after 1982. She ended up passing away, I think it was 2015 or 2016. And uh, so she was not here when Randy got inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, but I know that she probably played a role in that from heaven and is smiling down on every guitarist. I hope that anyone who watches this documentary will think of Randy Rhodes every time they think of Van Halen. He tried so hard to prove himself as a Van Halen equal, and I do believe that he was. Um, I'd be curious what you think in the comments. Let me know if you know Randy's playing, if you grew up watching Randy's playing, and if anybody has anything that they'd like to say comparing Randy's technique to Van Halen's technique, I think that would just be really fun to read. Um, obviously, say it in a nice way. Don't don't trash Van Halen. Don't trash Randy. You know, just a technical comment. Um, or opinion in that manner, I think would be really fun for me to go through the comments and read what your thoughts are and what you've thought if you've grown up watching them. Even if you haven't grown up watching them, I hope that you Google Randy Rhodes and look up his playing and watch some of his videos when he was with Quiet Riot even. Those are incredible videos. And of course, if you like this type of content, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and the thumbs up button. You have no idea how much that helps push the channel up in YouTube's algorithms. And this is a story I think is so important. I'd be so appreciative if you liked it, if you would do that. And of course, I will see you on the next Roots Rockumentary. Hungry for the road all my life. Thirsty for adventure all my youth. Chasing all my freedoms down Liberty Avenue.